it's Taylor Talks Comics. This is my library. This is my first ever library tour that I've done um, for my comic book collection. And I wanted to do it as a kind of a time capsule to show off what my library looks right now, especially in the moment we're doing some remodeling in the house. So this is not even the location that my permanent library will be going. So this is kind of temporary right now, but I wanted to show it off. And I like the idea of doing like a yearly library um, tour to kind of show how your collection evolves. I always talk about how my comic book collection is, it's an ongoing uh, attempt to try to curate the, the most perfect comic book collection for me as a fan. Um, and that's a never ending quest. That's kind of the fun part of the journey. Um, so you'll see a lot of things change over time. Like maybe next time I do a library tour, some of these books will be gone. Maybe I've sold them. Maybe I've you know, carved out huge chunks of what you see here. And maybe, hopefully, I'll add a lot of fun, awesome comic books that come out to the collection. I am going to do this in multiple parts. Um, I think the my favorite library tour I've seen on Comics YouTube, if you will, is For the Love of Comics. I really like that he broke it down by shelves and really gave an opportunity to put more time into showing off the books rather than just run through and say, here's all my Marvel omnibuses, here's all my duck comics, here's all my horror comics. Um, I think part of the journey and part of the library is to show off and explain why you bought these things or what makes these comic books so great, um, what made you enjoy them the most so that maybe you guys watching it will see something that you've never had on your radar and you'll be able to pick up and uh, try out for the first time. Or maybe you'll see some books that I have that you want to put in the comments, you want to recommend like, hey, I saw that you really like this genre, have you tried out this comic book? That sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I want it to be kind of interactive that way. So yeah, um, shout out to For the Love of Comics. I really like the way he did his, so I'm gonna do mine in that style in multiple parts. Um, the first part you see here will be what you see to my right, and then we'll go here, and then there's some that you can't see on camera. And then some in odds and, odd and, odds and ends places um, in the house that you'll see too. So um, thanks for joining me. I do have, I do want to put a disclaimer. I don't organize my library in the most like alphabetized or uh, by publisher. I know people are really kind of anal about the way they organize theirs. <clears throat> my first thing is uh, trim size. I want to, to put them in where they fit. And then I put usually well, things that are together, things that are the same series or theme or whatever. I put those together in the same spot. Otherwise they're kind of just thrown haphazardly in spots. So that might annoy people that are more anal about that, but I would say that uh, if I can't find a comic book I'm looking for within like 30 seconds or so, um, then I have too many books. And uh, so I know where they all are and that kind of thing, but it'll make it more variety per video as well. So you want to see all the same types of books um, on any given part. But I did want to put that in there too. Um, and yeah, let's get to it. Let's uh, hop to the, spin the camera around and do the tour. Um, like I said, Give this video a thumbs up and subscribe, and then also put in the comments anything you want to say about these or things that you recommend for me or things that you want further videos to be on. Um, if there's any books that I show off that you want a more elaborate video of me showcasing it in more um, detailed fashion, let me know too though in the comments. But yeah, so let's talk comics. So today we're just going to go over the first part of the library, which is going to be these shelves right here. Um, and then we'll move on to another part on another day. Uh, so starting first up here, we have the Usagi Ojimbo box set from Fantagraphics. This is the first 10 years of Usagi Ojimbo adventures. Then we have Hate and neat stuff from Peter Bagg. Peter Bagg's one of my all-time favorite cartoonists. And this one actually takes place chronologically first. This is the uh, debut of the Buddy Bradley character um, in this one-man anthology from Peter Bagg. And then Peter, or then 
Buddy Bradley would go on to uh, be the feature character in Hate. Then I have the John Stanley Library. These are all beautifully designed by uh, Canadian cartoonist Seth. Um, but these are the John Stanley comics. He is a great uh, golden age cartoonist. This first one is 13 Go Gun 30. It's like a teenage melodrama, kind of Archie style comics. And here's the one that you might know John Stanley from the most, and that's Nancy. Got three volumes of Nancy here. And then I have two volumes of Melvin the Monster from John Stanley. And finally, I have the spinoff character from the Nancy comics, Tubby. So I think I'm only missing two volumes of the John Stanley Library. From uh, this is these are published by uh, Drawn and Quarterly. I think I'm missing one Nancy volume and maybe one Melt of the Monster. I'm not sure. If I have any of my facts wrong, feel free to uh, correct me in the comments. I don't mind. <clears throat> I love talking comics and learning anything I can. This is the Atlas at War book. This was uh, done by Dead Reckoning. But this is the Atlas era of Marvel, their war comics. So if you don't know, Marvel comics used to be called Atlas and also Timely at one point. Um, this is specifically the Atlas era and it has great comic strips um, that are based on war comics. I'm trying to not be redundant here, but uh, you have great work from Russ Heath, Gene Colan, Sid Shores, John Severin, Don Heck, Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, and more. And uh, this, the art restoration was done by Alan, what's it say, Harvey, which is and Alan Harvey is actually doing the restoration on the new Fantagraphics line they just announced of Timely Era Golden Age comics that they will be printing soon. So, pretty excited about that. Up next, I have the Plastic Man Rubber Banded Edition from Kyle Baker. This is an awesome deluxe edition that even comes with a rubber band on the uh, spine there. Then I have the Jodorowsky section of my library. Alejandro Jodorowsky um, is a great writer who's worked with a lot of European cartoonists uh, in adapting a lot of science fiction type works. So i trying to get my... There's a black spot on camera there. Um, so these are all published by Humanoids. You won't see the ink up here because I have the slipcase. You'll see that later in the collection. It's a much taller book. But uh, most of Jodorowsky's books uh, do cross over into the same universe, uh, often called the Jodoverse. And uh, so a lot of these cross over into the same kind of universe and whatnot. Um, some of them are just their own thing. Like you see the Jodorowsky library right here, these four volumes. Um, there's more volumes to come. I think they've solicited three more volumes of these at least. Um, some of these stories are short stories he's done. Uh, the main universe, though, if you think of, like, the Jodoverse, you think, like, Inkal and Meta Barons. Uh, Techno Priest here, the first one, does take place in that universe. This is actually the Psychoverse. Um, I know it has the word verse in it to not be confusing, but this is the first Jodoverse book to not be written by Jodorowsky. So Alejandro Jodorowsky is in his 90s, and now he's licensing out... Um, the opportunity for new writers to write stories within that same universe. This one is written by Mark Russell with artwork by Yannick Paquette. This is the first one that came out. Um, the week that I'm filming this is when the Meta Barons 4 book comes out. We have the Before the Incal book, which I don't know, may be eventually put into one of these library editions. So I might be getting rid of this because on this edition, it has the final Incal in it. That's why I don't have the uh, solo or the final ACAL hardcover by itself because it's in this book. And this one has some shorter stories. Uh, what's the big one here? Oh, the J.H. Williams one, yeah. This was actually the first volume of the Jodorowsky Library. It has Megalex in it um, and Annabelle 5. You can see on the spine it actually doesn't say any of the titles on it. Um, that's something they did with the later volume, so it's kind of a little bit of annoying, but what can you do? This one has Son of a Gun and 
Pietro Lino. This is Meta Barons, one of the all time great space opera comic books that I highly recommend. If you're wanting to get into Johto verse books, um, or the Johto verse, the Incal, those kinds of things, I recommend either starting with this book, the Meta Barons, or starting with the Incal. This is the continuation of the Meta Barons. This is second cycle. Then I have the Nemo Trilogy box set. This is the hardcover box set that collects all three of the spinoff Nemo stories from Kevin O'Neill and Alan Moore from the uh, League of Extraordinary, Extraordinary Gentlemen story. Then I have Humbug. This slipcase um, is from Fantagraphics Books and it collects all the issues of Humbug Magazine, which was one of Harvey Kurtzman's comedic magazines that he came out with after he launched Mad Magazine. Then I have the uh, Moebius Library. These are from Dark Horse Comics. Uh, Moebius did uh, the Incal with Jodorowsky. So he's a French cartoonist that's just absolutely fantastic. Revolutionary for comics. But these first three are inside the Moebius, or inside of Moebius, or just inside Moebius, sorry. And we have the World of Adina and the art of Adina. Hopefully that one day there'll be more of these, but there's not been any further volumes announced. <clears throat> I know a lot of Mobius' uh, work is tied up in legal, legal drama that keeps us comic book fans away from being able to enjoy these great stories. Then we have uh, Paramus from Alberto Brescia. This is, uh, he's a, an amazing cartoonist that did a lot of great stories. Um, like Mort Cinder, uh, The Eternaut, this is a famous one that he did, but Fantagraphic book, Fantagraphics is doing a lot, is doing an Alberto Brescia library where they're printing all of his works. Paramus is a great story about a revolution, fighting, a, a big revolution fighting a fascist government type deal. Then we have the Complete Women's Comics. This is a fantastic anthology of underground comics done by women. Um, and, and the comic book was called Women's Comics, spelled just like you see there. Um, so you think like Zap Comics from like Robert Crumb and Spain Rodriguez and that, those kinds of guys. Women of the same era wanted to do their own underground venture. And that's when women's comics came about. Then we have, speaking of great women cartoonists from the underground, we have Julie Doucet's Dirty Plot Slipcase box set. She's a great French Canadian cartoonist. Then I have the New Yorker um, hardcover slipcase up here, the Encyclopedia of Cartoons. So up top there you see, obviously, like I said in my intro, there's not a, a ton of organization with how I collect my books. Um, I try to keep the same style books or collections of books together, but then beyond that, they're just kind of thrown together, um, especially on the top here. Eventually when I get into my permanent library, I will have uh, shelves up there that are like reinforced and put into the walls. Um, and these probably won't be up there. These will be on different shelves. But for now, since they're kind of freestanding, um, I just put the most sturdy, the sturdiest books that can stand on their own with also with box sets that can hold some weight and stand on their own as well. That was the decision there. Let's go to this first shelf. We have some Marvel omnibuses um, thrown here. Up first, we have Howard the Duck. This is the more modern run by uh, Chip Zdarsky and Joe Kionius. Um, Steve Gerber is one of my all-time favorite comic book writers. He co-created the Howard the Duck character. And Chip Zdarsky, so far, has been like one of the few people that I've seen take on Howard the Duck after Gerber and do it in a way that was um, honorable to the original intentions of the character, if you will. Then I have Annihilation, Annihilation Conquest, and Road to War of Kings. These make up the first three chapters of five of the modern cosmic um, story from Marvel. You can see on the back here, this is where you'll you'll notice um, the Guardians of the Galaxy that you know, know and love from the MCU. This is where they were, that particular team of the Guardians of the Galaxy was created um, by Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning. That takes place in here, too. Uh, so this is the first three chapters of the saga. Um, the fourth one, which is just called War of Kings, comes out... The reprint is coming out later this year. 
And I'm hoping the aftermath is pre-printed because I would like to have all five chapters. Then I have The Amazing Spider-Man by David Michelinie and Todd McFarlane. And Spider-Man by Todd McFarlane. These two omnibuses comprise of all of Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man work for Marvel. Uh, it holds a special place in my heart because my brother, um, who is known as Real American Brian on YouTube, he has his own YouTube channel. A lot of focus on G.I. Joe comics and stuff, so if you're into that, but he is branching out into other comics and whatnot. So give him a, a follow and subscribe on his channel. But he's my older brother, and back in the day when I was like, I think 9 or 10, he gave me a, uh, for my birthday, he bought me a Todd McFarlane Spider-Man trade paperback. And I just read it to, like, tatters. I just love that that book as a, a young kid. Um, so these hold a special place in my heart, just as far as my... The makings of me as a comic book fan kind of thing. The Mighty Thor Heroes Return by Dan Jurgens and the great John Romita Jr. This is the run after... Um, Heroes Reborn is where uh, Jim Lee and, and Rob Liefeld took a lot of the Marvel characters and... Marvel, I guess, licensed them out to Image for a year, and then this is their, their return of that. Cable, Soldier X. So you'll see a lot of Cable comics in my collection. I'm trying to do a big Cable read-through. I am a Rob Liefeld apologist. I'm a big fan of his work, and the Cable character, I think, has just always been awesome and intriguing. Um, and I have, But I haven't read through his entire history, so I, I've collected pretty much every appearance of him for the first, I don't know, 20 years or so. Uh, I was character in collected editions. Um, so this is part of that. This was an era when he wasn't being called Cable. He's just being called Soldier X. I guess there's some legal but legal drama with Rob Liefeld during that time. This is Doctor Strange by Jason Aaron and the great Chris Bacolo. Chris Bar Bacolo's artwork is just... It's always incredible. Um, and he really did a, a wonder on the Doctor Strange character here. This is Spectacular Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 1. And you'll see next to it we have Spider-Man by Roger Stern. These are actually a great pair because you can see on the back here. The last issue in this book is Spectacular Spider-Man 42. And the first issue in this book is Spectacular Spider-Man 41. So if you have both these volumes, you have the first 61 issues of Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, eventually there will be a proper Volume 2, I think. Uh, but until now, that's the best thing to do if you want to read Spectacular Spider-Man. This is Untold Tales of Spider-Man. This is where Kurt Busiek and Pat Olaf... This this takes place in the... Sorry. In the 90s they did this. Like, in the mid-90s they did this comic book, but it actually takes place during the Silver Age of Marvel. Um, some issues, they even have a map in the back where they tell you when the issues take place. Uh, but it all takes place during the Steve Ditko, Stanley era. And they'll have, like, some issues take place between some of the Ditko issues, some between pages of some of the Ditko issues. Uh, but it's a fun, fun story. And they just... Kurt, Kurt Busiek is just, like, a legendary historian of the comic book world and also one of the great superhero writers. Um, there's few writers where I... Like, modern writers where I trust anything they do with superheroes. Kurt Busiek and I say... Probably Mark Wade is the other one. These are the first two volumes of Silver Age X-Men omnibuses. Um, they're a little bit abandoned from the rest of the Silver Age Marvel you can see over here. <clears throat> not, not for any other reason besides shelf, shelf space. They didn't fit over there, but they'll eventually be with their Silver Age brothers and sisters later. Um, that's great, great stuff. This is obviously before the Chris Claremont era, so people kind of downplay this a lot. Um, this first volume, it, it is Jack Kirby's probably, like, his, uh, less, um, ambitious work, I guess, of the Silver Age, but it's still fun Kirby comics, and you have a great issue in there where Alex Toth actually did a, uh, inky, inky on Kirby, which is fun to uh, look at, and this one has great artwork from, uh, Jim Stranko does a couple issues in here. And then also uh, Neil Adams during the Roy Thomas year. So there's still some fun stuff in that era that I think people kind of don't appreciate enough. The next shelf down here, I've got the Scott Pilgrim series. All six volumes in hardcover of the 
colored editions. So this is one of the great independent um, black and white comics because these are the, like I said, these are the colored editions, but it was originally released in black and white. But I put this up there with like TMNT, Bone, The Walking Dead, um, and Scott Pilgrim are all like great independent black and white comics that kind of, uh, they like went over the mainstream and, and started getting into the hands of non-comic book readers. But great series by Brian Lee O'Malley. Actually bought these editions from Just Bragg, the Omni Dogs Vault on YouTube. He's one of my, my good friends that I talked to quite a bit. Uh, but I bought those for him, so that's part of that in my collection. And then I have the Goon, the Bunch of Old Crap. That's literally what they're called. Um, volume is one, three, four, and five. Volume two is next to my bed right now with, for some uh, light reading. But these are the Albatross um, funny books printings of these of this material. That's Eric Powell's own comic book uh, publishing company, I guess. But just recently, Eric Powell has brought Albatross funny books back to Dark Horse as an imprint. Um, so I'm assuming. We'll get the library editions that they've came out with in the past, reprinted of these, and I'll probably upgrade to those because I love our Eric Powell's artwork. Um, and The Goon is a fun story. It's like, think of like 1920s mobsters, but mixed with like ghouls, goblins, witches, and zombies. Just a fun, 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 fun comic. Then I have the first four volumes, I guess the only four volumes of the Howard the Duck Complete Collections. I went this route with Howard the Duck because the omnibus that they came out with um, didn't have all the material that's in here. I think it was the Howard the Duck magazines that this these collect that was not in the omnibus. Uh, yeah, this collects all the Howard the Duck magazines. I'm thinking that's what the material was that wasn't in the omnibus, but regardless, I know these have material that wasn't in the omnibus, so that's why I went this route. And like I said, Steve Gerber's one of my favorite writers, so had to get that um with that said i should backtrack a bit all the steve gerber material is in the omnibus the stuff that's in these that's not was not steve gerber stuff but i digress then i have uh isagi ojimbo volume one through six of the isagi ojimbo saga books these are the dark dark horse books these are like thick 600 page trade paperbacks that are super affordable um You'll see a lot of people have like the super rare hardcovers. Those are going to fetch like crazy amount of money on, on eBay and whatnot because those, those were limited to like 1,500 copies. These are are meant to be evergreen, and these are the actual second editions that they've just reprinted recently. Just go this route. Um, Yusagi Ojimbo should be read by all comic book fans. It's just amazing cartooning and storytelling at its finest. Um, and these actually take place after the box set. So the box that you saw, the first thing I showed off, that's the first 10 years of Usagi Adventures. That's published by Fantagraphics. The next, the very next thing to go to will be these sagas uh, by Dark Horse, Volume 1. And the great thing about Usagi, though, is you can start at any of these volumes and not be lost. Stan Sakai does it in such a fa fascinating way that you can pick up at, at the beginning of any arc and not be lost. Um... So if you can't find volume one, for instance, I don't, I think it's still in print, but if you can't, don't, don't hesitate. Just grab another one. Then I have Headlopper. This is a great barbarian comic. Volume one is next to my bed right now. So that's why I don't have it here. But this is Angel McLean doing a great cartoony looking, uh, wandering barbarian story. Like you think of like Conan and whatnot, but it's like bloody and violent, but done in a cartoony way. So. A lot of fun fun there. I hope one day we get an oversized hardcover of that. Down here I have some McNolaverse and Outerverse stuff. So these are all Mike McNola's names on all of these. Um, this first section here is like the Outerverse, though. It's not technically in the Hellboy universe. The Outerverse is something different. That's something that he does with Christopher Golden. This first one is Joe Golem, a cult detective. I actually need to read this. Um... This is a re recent purchase of a few months ago, but I still haven't picked it up. But I got it because I love Baltimore so much. Baltimore is the series that he, Christopher Golden, did with Mike McDullough. Um And there's two volume on of us there. And they, those are the most deceiving ones, because they look like the Hellboy omnibuses. They should have kept it more in line with what that looks like, but 
whatever. And this is the Lady Baltimore, which is the follow-up. So those four comprise of the omnibus editions or over, I, I don't know, hardcover versions of uh, the Outerverse. Then we have Witchfinder. This does, does take place in the Hellboy universe. Um, so we have volumes one and two of those. Then we have Lobster Johnson, who's my favorite spinoff character of the Hellboy universe. He's like a pulp era superhero and just amazing stuff. And that, especially like, there's just a lot of, um, John Arcudi does the writing on that. And there's a lot of, like, if you like the uh, Batman, the animated series that has like that pulp aesthetic in those like darks, dark blacks and stuff, um, Lobster Johnson will be right up your alley. Up next we have Godland. Um, these these are the Celestial Edition hardcovers. Um, this was a great series by Tom Scioli and Joe Casey. And this was a total love letter to Jack Kirby and Jim Starlin Cosmic Stories. So you can see in here, uh, Tom Scioli's artwork is already a love letter to Jack Kirby. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of things that if you love like Warlock and the Thanos stuff early on and Silver Surfer from Jim Starlin, you'll enjoy that. Um, but those are three hardcovers that came out. And that's an image series that doesn't need, doesn't, doesn't get enough praise. Um, it's really f fun stuff. Then I have the Mind Management Field Reports. This is volume one, volume two, and volume three. These are Matt, Matt Kent's Magna Opus. Magnum Opus. And the first volume here actually have signed and sketched uh, if I can get to the page here. Nope. Okay. There we go. This one's signed and sketched. Most of the time, if you buy something from Matt Kent's personal website, which you can find on all of his social media, he'll sign and sketch it for you. Uh, trying to put this back in here carefully with one hand. Apologize for the shaky camera for a minute. Okay. But Money Management's a great uh, spy story. Uh, the genre that Matt Kent works the best in, I feel like, is the spy genre. Um, and if you're into that kind of thing, like especially like Cold Era, Cold War era kind of spy stuff, and um, but Matt Kent does a, such such a great job of like humanizing the characters too, so you start to learn and care about the characters. But there's all kinds of twists and turns and Easter eggs you pick up on along the way that Matt Kent just really fully fleshed out um, that world. There's a great world building in there. This is the escapist. Uh, this, so this is the escapist was a character that the two um, titular characters in the great novel by Michael Chabon uh, called *The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay*. Cavalier and Clay wrote in within that story. It's a fictional story. Were two comic book creators that created a, the character *The Escapist*, um, and this is the follow-up to that by Brian K. Vaughan in comic book form. The original novel is a prose novel, uh, but it sh should be read by all comic book fans. It's just an amazing tale, and it's all it's entrenched in, in comic book history, so it, there's a lot of non-fictional aspects to it, if you will. I guess it's a, what do you call that, historical fiction? And then these are, these two volumes here, um, these are all Dark Horse books, are a bunch of different cartoonists doing their take on the escapist character. So it's kind of like uh, taking that character within the story and then doing comics of it. Right here, I have the EC Comics Artist Library, the beginning of it. This is the first eight books. Um, the rest of them will be in a later video. I do have every volume so far from Fantagraphics. These are black and white reprints of the great EC Comics of the 1950s. Um, EC Comics was, I mean, EC Comics in general is just like one of the greatest publishers of all time, even in the short time that they were really around. Um, but they did horror comics, war comics, science fiction, and crime comics. And they were part of the uh, Senate hearings that led to the Comics Code Authority being a thing. Uh, Frederick Wortham really took them to task and really changed comic books in the, in the worst way ever since then. But this is the before that. So each volume has one artist's work in it and is usually one genre. Each volume is kept to one genre, uh, but each artist will have multiple volumes if they did a lot of work, like Jack Davis, Johnny Craig have multiple volumes. Um, Al Williamson, though, I think still only has one volume. 
Then Ghastly Graham Ingalls was one of the horror, um, the geniuses of the horror genre in EC. So he has multiple volumes as well. On the next shelf down, I've got the Don Rosa Library. And the, there's 10 volumes of the Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck Don Rosa Library. I only have nine of them. I'm still missing volume eight. So I need to pick that up. Especially because we've heard recent things about Disney since... Uh, Censoring, I guess. Maybe maybe not censoring is not the word, but no longer printing one of the stories that takes place in Volume 5. So I need to get it before... I don't know if they're going to continue on with that path. Um, but regardless, Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck um, are just fantastic all-age adventure comics. When I say all ages, I always uh, advocate for the idea that all ages truly means all ages. Some people feel like when they hear all ages, they think, oh, that's kid stuff. But it truly sh can be enjoyed by adults and children. Um, but Don Rosa was a really great underground cartoonist from the Kentucky region who grew up as a major uh, Carl Barks fan. So then he eventually did a tryout and got his chance to do his own love letter to the Carl Barks era duck comics. And that's what comprises this entire collection. Then we have Bizarro, the deluxe edition. This is a bunch of independent and underground cartoonists doing comedic stories in the DC universe. Um, cover there is by Matt Groening. But you'll also see work in here by um, Jill Thompson, Paul Pope, Jeff Smith, Mo Willems, Pat Oswalt, Gilbert and Jaime Hernandez, Paul Dini, Raina Tagemeyer, Evan Dorkin, and more. This is The Eternals. This is a more modern take on The Eternals from Jack Kirby's creation. But this is done by Neil Gaiman and John Romita Jr. Always an Invader. This is another Chip Zdarsky book. Um, I love The Invaders. It's kind of a revisionist retcon history. But it's kind of like the Marvel superhero era before the Silver Age. So you think like the Marvel uh, line of superheroes kind of starts with Fantastic Four number one. Well, before that, they did have, in the Golden Age, you know, Namor, the original Human Torch, and Captain America. <clears throat> uh, the Invaders team, which is an omnibus for you, you'll see later, it's kind of like a retcon history of like, well, Captain America, Namor, and Human Torch really interacted with each other, and a lot of times teamed up with their sidekicks and stuff. This is a modern um, story by Chip Zdarsky, kind of going back to the idea of this... Those guys teaming up and whatnot. <clears throat> this is Black Bolt. This is a fantastic story by Saladin Ahmed uh, and with great artwork from Christian Ward. It's kind of like a Black Bolt in jail story, but it's got a lot of twists and turns to it that you won't see coming, and it all takes place in this one hardcover. If you're not familiar with the Inhumans, um, you can still read this without any prior knowledge of the Inhumans. But I think it'll make you probably fall in love with those characters and want to explore more. And then speaking of Chip Zdarsky, this is the oversized hardcover of the Fantastic Four, Fate of the Four. This was the era of Fantastic Four when Marvel wasn't publishing Fantastic Four comics, like the recent history. Uh, a lot of rumors that they were doing it because they didn't have the film rights to the characters. Who knows? But this is Zdarsky kind of taking two of the four and doing a story of, of them, you know having their fun adventures together without Sue and, and Reed. One of my all-time favorite cartoonists is Basil Warburton. Uh, this is a biography, coffee table books, but also has plenty of his comics in it as well. These are by Fantagraphics Books. Um, so you get like a lot of history of Basil, but then a lot of his comics as well. This one, volume one has 1909 to 1941. And then, and that's called Creeping Death from Neptune. And then Brain Bats of Venus has work from 1942 to 1952. He's a fantastic cartoonist that did great horror, science fiction, and comedic stuff. You'll see a lot more of his comics later in my collection. Then I have Firepower. This is Robert Kirkman and Chris Samney's, kind of their take on the their version of Iron Fist, I guess. But it's it's been really good so far, and Chris Samney is just an amazing artist. Um, so I'll keep, I'll keep giving that a, a go, even though Robert Kirkman hasn't ever really wowed me in a great way. Um, this is uh, Ice Cream Man. This is uh, 
a great modern horror comic anthology where the titular character Ice Cream Man is the only character that kind of takes place in every issue. He's kind of like the horror host of like, you know, like, like Tales of the Crypt and the Crypt Keeper and whatnot. He's the horror host of this one, but he actually plays part in a lot of the stories. Um, or some of them, not always, but he's in there. Then we have Dork by Evan Dorkin. This is uh, Evan Dorkin's great one-man anthology. I feel like I call every book great, but um, it's my 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 library, and these are all great. Uh, <clears throat> take a shot every time I say great. Actually, please don't. Um, but this is Evan Dorkin's, like I said, one-man anthology. Uh, I tried this out because I love great one-man anthologies like... Uh, eight ball and and hate and neat stuff um this is a little bit this is like the next era of that and evan dorkin's cartooning is great so i tried this out it started off really hilarious and i was really digging it and then it blew my mind in like issue seven or eight or nine one of those issues people that know dork will know what issue i'm talking about really took me for a trip and it then became one of my favorite books i've ever read this is Rick Veach's The One, The Last Word on Superheroics. This is a fantastic superhero comic, a uh, superhero de deconstructionist comic. And it was, um, it came out before Watchmen and before the era of where that was popular to deconstruct superheroes. Rick Veach is one of the first graduates of the Kubert School of Cartooning. And he also did work with Alan Moore on Swamp Thing with his fellow QB graduates, uh, Stephen Bissett and John Tuttleman. This is another Rick Veach tale, uh, or series, Brat Pack. This takes place, or this came out much later, but this is like a commentary on sidekicks and superheroes and how twisted the idea of bringing adolescent children out as your sidekicks into danger can be. And once you read that, you'll never be able to read a Batman comic the same way ever again. Monsters by Barry Windsor Smith. This is Barry Windsor Smith's magnum opus for sure. Uh, in 2021, this was my number one read of that year, and it it just needs to be read by all comic book fans. Um, <clears throat> the easy premise is that this is like the Incredible Hulk, and then Barry Windsor Smith takes it because it was originally was going to be an Incredible Hulk story, but Barry Windsor Smith, uh, Marvel kind of said no to it, so Barry Windsor Smith like took it and grew it and developed it over time over like 20 plus years, and then made it into this thing. And it's just a masterpiece. Down here, I have the Team of T uh, Ultimate Collections. I have a video on all six volumes of this. So check that out if you want. But those are the original Eastman Laird comic books, uh, the, the black and white comic books. Then I have Soul Van Sluggers. James Stokoe is one of my favorite cartoonists going today. And this is a great slipcase edition of a story where a minor league baseball team takes on a bunch of different monsters and zombies. This is the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror Ominous Omnibus die cut glow in the dark slipcase. I have a video of that on my YouTube channel as well. You can check out if you want a closer look. And I don't know if I said this in the intro or not, but if there's any other books on here in my collection that you want to get a closer look at, um, like a more in depth video about, let me know. And I'll be happy to do that. Sometimes I have trouble figuring out what videos I want to do or what books I want to cover in videos. And uh, you can help me out with that. This is The Death Ray. Daniel Klaus is one of the greatest independent cartoonists ever. This is him kind of doing a superhero tale. The Fifth Beetle, the Brian Epstein story. Um, if you're a Beatles fan, you have to read this. If you're a fan of music history, you have to read this. It really, like, the cartooning itself is amazing, but the story is such an in-depth look at how important Brian Epstein was to the success of the Beatles, who are, like, the greatest of all time music act. And it's good to, it's cool to see um, that they could, they didn't just do it on their own. Brian Epstein played a huge role in that. Welcome to Oddville. Jay Stevens is an awesome cartoonist that has, like, he does, like, this uh, kind of Harvey Comics take on his artwork um this is more this is welcome to oddville this has stuff for <clears throat> all ages comics some of this stuff is just for adults um but it can be deceiving because it has that kind of harvey harvey comics style 
Wonder Woman Dead Earth. This is Dana Warren Johnson, another one of my favorite cartoons going today. Um, you'll see more of his comics later. This is Wonder Woman Dead Earth, though. This is a DC Black Label and a recent comic that came out. I think this is like Wonder Woman's Dark, Re Dark Knight Returns, and it should have been praised as such. Like, it got praised, but it, it really should be touted as one of the great DC comics of all time. I have a video on this one. This is Panel by Panel Fantastic Four. <clears throat> this is the Inkel slipcase that I talked about earlier. This was reprinted recently by Humanoids. Here's, let me move the camera this way. And this is a deluxe slipcase with a sleeve on it. Oversized artwork of Mobius. <clears throat> this is also reprinted recently. This is the Dave Stevens Rocketeer comics. Dave Stevens created the character of the Rocketeer. That went, in, went on to be in a movie and uh, also other future comic book series. But this is Dave Stevens. All of, those, all of the comics from his run on the character. And it's in this oversized slipcase edition. Which is great because his artwork deserves to be in oversized treatment. This is Black Phoenix. I am going to do a video on this because I love it so much. And I think more people need to get their eyes on it. But this is Rich Tommaso's... Um, magazine anthology where it's him doing all these different styles and genres of comics in magazine format like you can see one of the covers there there's even articles in here like old sci-fi pulp type articles but Rich Tomasso is just an amazing chameleon of an artist that can do a number number of different styles that's the exclusive hardcover that came out from Floating World that was crowdfunded the Ballad of Halo Jones, what some people refer to as Alan Moore's greatest comic book with Ian Gibson. This is the slipcase edition that 2000 AD just recently came out with. Judge Dredd. I think this is my one Judge Dredd book I have in my collection. This is the Brendan McCarthy collection. Um, I love Brendan McCarthy and his artwork and his style. And this collects all of his Judge Dredd stories. I mentioned Seth earlier, who designed the John Stanley Library. This is Seth's own comic book, George Spratt. You can see it has a very similar style to the John Stanley Library. Um, this is his extremely oversized book <clears throat> of a fictional character, George Spratt, that he created. This is Monograph from Chris Ware. It's kind of like a biography slash uh, coffee table book of Chris Ware and all the artwork he's done and kind of thing. It's really an amazing uh, piece. And just seeing the talent of Chris Ware that exceeds beyond just cartooning in there. This is Wednesday Comics. This was a uh, experiment from DC where they did um, like broadsheet sized one, one page comic strips from a bunch of different cartoonists and really let them just kind of do their own thing. So each page is just one strip but does tell an, an ongoing story. And it was released on Wednesdays in, on newsprint that folded up into the exact same size as like a single issue comic book, they reprinted it into this hardcover right here. This is building stories from Chris Ware. This is like a game board box set or box. And on the inside of it um, are like 20 different formats and, and versions of comic books that Chris Ware did that can be read in any order, but tell a story. You're literally building a story. It's a really fantastic experiment with what you can do with comics. All right, next, um, as we finish up this section of the library, is the beginning of Marvel's Silver Age section. And these first five volumes are like comprised of what leads into, what leads into, rather, the Marvel Silver Age. So we have two volumes here of Masters of Suspense by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. These are all like four to eight page strips of um, Steve Ditko doing horror or suspense stories. Kind of like, if you're into EC Comics, you'll love these. This next one is The Complete Kirby War and Romance. This is, collects a lot of uh, Jack Kirby's golden, silver age, uh, Marvel War and Romance stories. Um, which are amazing because Jack Kirby obviously was in combat during World War II. So he has a perspective on that. And then with romance, he was one of the co-creators of the romance genre in comics with Joe Simon. So, fantastic volume. And there's also like 15 issues of Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos in that. Um, so, it kind of acts as ostensibly 
Sergeant Fury's one omnibus that we have. <clears throat> this is Monsters. So, like I said, we have the Steve Ditko Suspense Horror collections here. This is Jack Kirby, his monster stories with Larry Lieber and Stan Lee. There is a second volume, or a first volume, that I need to pick up, that I need to find. And I do love that they even went to the lengths of make, calling this a monster bus instead of omnibus. That's pretty cool. This is August 61. Uh, this book gets a lot of flack, but I love it. This collects every comic book that Marvel put out in August 1961. That month is important because that's the month that Fantastic Four debuted. So you'll, this is a great collection to read in context because you get to read all the comics that they're putting out. And then you see the transformative Fantastic Four, which shook the company to its core and made them really go full force into superheroes. So you get a lot of Millie the Model, Patsy Walker, Romance Stories, Kid Cult Outlaw, Western Stories, Rawhide Kid. And I would love one day a, a complete Kirby Western um, comic book that has a lot of its Western stories. We have The Amazing Spider-Man, Volumes 2, 3, and 5 of the Omnibuses. I don't have Volume 1 because I have the Tashin book you'll see later. And Tashin, if they do a second volume, will comprise of all the issues in Volume 1. And the way Tashin reproduces the issues is my preferred way to read them. Um, so eventually, if Tashin does like all the Marvel Silver Age, I'll replace all of these in the Tashin editions, and I'll be happy with that. And then Volume 4 is getting reprinted the, later this year, so I will complete that section of it. But great stuff from Steve Ditko, John Romita Sr., um, and then Ross Andrew over here. Ross Andrew is my second favorite Spider-Man artist. Uh, that's not his art, but he's in this volume. <clears throat> After uh, Steve Ditko, of course. This is Black Panther, The Early Years. This collects all of the jungle action adventures, the Silver Age adventures of Black Panther, including his first appearances and his appearances within the Avengers stories and whatnot. Originally solicited as a volume one, they took that off, which concerns me because there could be a whole, there's a, enough material to do a volume two and... I don't know how they'll collect that otherwise. Black Widow Strikes. This is a lot of the Black Widow Silver and Bronze Age appearances of that character. Then this is just a dust jacket because I'm currently reading this book. But this is volumes one through three of Captain America. I just finished Captain America number one and I absolutely loved and adored that book. Uh, I'm with everybody else that thinks like Silver Age Spider-Man and Fantastic Four are like the high points of Silver Age Marvel. That I put it right up there with it. Down here I have some single issues over here. And then I also have this book, which the aforementioned Real American Brian is letting me borrow. It's Howling Commandos of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, I thought it was versus something. Oh, Monster Squad. Where they're fighting some of the monsters of Marvel. And uh, I need to read that and return it to him. But um, I'm excited to read that. Then we have two volumes of... Um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, this is The Tempest, and this is, those are falling down over there. Hard to do with one hand. This is Century. It's just uh, Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill, and what they did with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is just amazing. They took like all these literary characters and then put them together. <clears throat> um, and just like the story they fashioned in that way. I, I think it's Alan Moore's greatest accomplishment the way he was able to weave that story together. Um, but Alan Moore's my favorite writer of all time in comics. And it's not my favorite Alan Moore story, but I do think it's his most accomplished. Then I have uh, Disney Masters. I have a box set of this. Um, it has one volume of Donald Duck, one volume of Mickey Mouse. The Disney Masters line from Fantagraphics is where European cartoonists, it collects all the classic European cartoonists uh, strips of those characters. <clears throat> Then I have, what is this? Oh, it's a reproduction. It's a guide on, like the original guide that came out to show you how to make mini comics. It's never been printed formally, so I just printed it off myself. <clears throat> then I have the Carl Barks collection, or section of my library here. Carl Barks is the original, the good duck, art, good duck artist. And what that means is that back in the day, there's a couple slip cases. They always put like two volumes into a slipcase eventually. So they'll release like this volume and this one and throw it into a slipcase. I just, I don't prefer the slipcases because I really think they just take up shelf space. Um, but they were the cheaper way to get some of these volumes. So I'm not going to throw away the box. But however, 
or how, uh, back to what I was saying. Um, back in the golden age of comics, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they didn't always credit artists and cartoonists, so you'd get like a Disney comic book and it would just say, from Walt Disney. Um, but people started to notice that of all the Duck comics, there was one artist in particular that was doing things better than everybody else. They didn't know his name though, so they just referred it to as, oh, that's the good Duck artist. Eventually, historians figured it out and um, attributed it to Karl Barks. Thankfully, before Karl Barks left us, um, he passed away a number of years ago. Um, but so now Fantagraphics is going through and collecting all of the Karl Barks stories in this library. I don't have every volume. I'm missing four or five of them. But these are great adventure comics. If you're familiar with DuckTales, some, duck, some hardcore Duck comics fans will be upset with me even mentioning DuckTales, but I'm going to because if you're a fan of DuckTales, you should re read this for sure. Um, but also, one thing I always like to mention is that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg cite these as very influential to their um, writing, and they are, like I said, adventure comics to the point where some of them, some of the stories they may have borrowed for Indiana Jones. Fun fact. Down here I have The Fantastic Four by John Byrne, Volume 1. I used to have both volumes. Um, I bought Volume, and then I sold them, and then I bought Volume 1 in anticipation to get the Volume 2 reprint. I've not got that yet. Um, but they're great stories. Um, John Byrne is one of the few uh, points of Fantastic Four that I would cite for people to uh, try out, um, or starting point for Fantastic Four. And Fantastic Four is my favorite Marvel comic. If there's one line that I love and collect, it's Fantastic Four. Then I have the one, the one Star Wars book in my collection is Star Wars Droids and Ewoks. I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan. I mean, I like the movies, you know, as much as the next guy. But Star Wars comics had never really appealed to me. I've tried them and just, I don't know, I just feel like it works better as a movie. But I know I know it has their place and people are huge fans of Star Wars comics. This is the Droids and Ewoks, though. I got this liquidated and it's like the Saturday morning cartoons of Ewoks and Droids. I got this for my son and I to enjoy, and he does, so. This is the Man Thing, this thick book. Um, it collects all of Steve Gerber's Man Thing stories. Fantastic Four, Omnibus by Fraction, uh, Matt Fraction, with artwork by M Mark Bagley and Mike Allred. This was a era, this takes place actually after the Jonathan Hickman era. Um, it doesn't get as much, like a ton of praise, but Mike Allred, I think, is the, the best cartoonist going today and my number one favorite going today i know i said a lot of other people are my, some of my favorite cartoonists going today but mike allred's number one for sure um and him doing fantastic four i do i do wish that he had a full run on fantastic four besides this this was kind of a i don't know it wasn't real to me i guess the way he did it but it, regardless that's a run that not a lot of people love but i think it i think it deserves reading X-Men Grand Design by Ed Piscor. He's one of my favorite cartoonists going today, just to um, add another shot to that. But the Grand Design project itself was created by Ed Piscor and has been subsequently done by Tom Scholey with Fantastic Four and Jim Rugg with The Hulk. Um, those are all three friends from Pittsburgh area. I love this project, though. It's basically one cartoonist doing the writing, coloring, penciling, inking, lettering, Right, uh, I already said writing everything. Just one one guy doing it, and then telling the story of one team or character throughout Marvel history. Then I have the Timeless Greatest Library. So there's only four volumes of this, but this collects the classic Golden Age stories of the Submariner by Bill Everett. This is the Golden Age uh, Simon and Kirby. So it has all the Captain America stories plus all the other ones I did where they created the original Vision. And then Carl Burgos' uh, Golden Age Human Torch stories. I love Golden Age comics and Silver Age comics. Um, these really were instrumental in me falling in love with Golden Age superheroes and trying them out. Um, these are great reproductions too done by Marvel. Just really stunning the way they reproduce the artwork. X-Men vs. Apocalypse the 12. This is an odd one that I have in my collection, but I got this for the Cable read-through that I mentioned before. Um, it has a lot of his appearances in it and it was important for my reading order 
Jonathan Hickman, Volume 1 and 2. If you're wanting a modern era of Fantastic Four, you can't go wrong with this one. And everything that you need to know and read is in these two volumes. And Jonathan Hickman is one of the best writers going that can really add twists and turns and throw things on your head um, and just have you guessing and wanting more. Uh, he's just amazing, amazing writer. Um, and he did a great job with the Marvel's first family there. The Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, volume one, and then I have volume two over here. These collect the Deadly Hands of Kung Fu magazine. It was a black and white magazine back in the 70s. And this it ran for 33 issues. Um, so both those volumes have all the magazine issues in there. Then I have Miracle Man Omnibus by uh, Alan Moore. You won't find his name on here. He wished that it wouldn't be on there. But this was before Watchmen. This is him taking a character that's like... Um, the history of this character is crazy. But Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam. Um, this was the... Miracle Man was a... Uh, I'm not going to get into the history. But this is Alan Moore um, doing a deconstruction of superhero. And it's just... Amazing how deep and powerful the story still holds up today, um, but it has been um, aped and stolen from and borrowed from the themes and stories of this for so many other stories that if someone's reading this for the first time now, they might not realize how impactful it was at the time. This is the aforementioned Invaders Omnibus. Had to go for the Jack Kirby cover. But this is Roy Thomas's retconning revisionist history. He wrote this in the 70s. But he was going back. These all take place during the 50s era of history um, of Captain America, Submariner, uh, and Human Torch, plus all their sidekicks and some other characters teaming up um, in kind of like the Avengers before the Avengers during a different time period. I already talked about that one. This is Captain Britain. This also is by Alan Moore. Um, this book blew my mind. I thought this was going to be like your traditional capes and cowls and tights superhero comic book. It was not at all. This was, and this, because this was Alan Moore's one of his first superhero takes, I didn't know how ambitious he was going to be with it. And I read it and it just blew my mind. The ideas and concepts that Alan Moore had before he even really was in getting into comics. This is the Eternals. This is the complete saga, the expanded omnibus. Um, that's not the expanded version. They recently came out with an expanded version of Captain Britain that collects a lot more. I just wanted the Alan Moore story, so I just opted for the old, old printing. Um, this is the Eternals, the, the expanded edition. I honestly wouldn't mind downgrading, quote-unquote, to just the, the thinner omnibus they came out with that just has the Jack Kirby stuff, because that's what's important to me. Um, but this is Jack Kirby returning to Marvel in the 70s and doing a cosmic tale on the scale of what he was doing with like the fourth world in DC. This is Namor, the Submariner. This is the 90s era um, run by John Byrne and Jay Lee. Ecstatics. Um, it does have an X in the title, but th this is not bogged down with X-Men continuity. It stands on its own. This is Mike Allred and Peter Milligan doing a take on a superhero team that also wants to be celebrities, um, but there's a lot of like death involved. Characters die off, don't fall in love with any certain character as you're reading it, um, because they might not last long. Um, but it's just a true look at what a superhero team would be in the modern era. This is Fantastic Four by Wade and Re Ringo. Um, I said Jonathan Hickman is a great modern run of Fantastic Four to recommend for people as like a jumping on point to the team. This is the best modern run for people to jump onto. Mark Wade, I did mention it earlier with Kurt Basic is a historian of superhero comics and just understands the genre of superheroes um, and honors it with heart. Um, this is his take on my, like I said, my favorite Marvel comic book. And he just honors the first family in a way that would make Jack Kirby proud, I think. But, um, and the artwork by Mike Waringo is fantastic in here as well. I highly recommend that one. That one's way out of print right now, but it did rate or did finish highly in the near mint condition Omnibus reprint poll, so don't overpay for this because I think it sh I think it'll be reprinted soon. Justice League International Omnibus Volume One. This was my favorite read I read last year. Um, it kind of was a 
precursor to what you see in ecstatics. So everything I said about ecstatics being like a superhero team, uh, kind of reaching celebrity status in a way, you, you see a lot of those seeds being planted in this volume, uh, but just a humanizing version of superheroes that uh, is an amazing accomplishment for like the team that worked on it because Keith Giffen did the layouts and then wrote the story, but J.M. DeMatteis um, scripted the story and then Kevin McGuire did the artwork. So like, it was like Keith Giffen putting the bones down, but then Kevin McGuire and John, J.M. DeMatteis going over the top with their own things. And it just, it worked so well. These are the first three volumes of Kevin, or, ooh, Kevin, Ed Brubaker, I apologize. Um, his run on Captain America, volumes four and five are being reprinted this year. So I will be able to finish that set as well. And then the last shelf, this has already been a long video, so you can see why I split this into multiple videos. This first book is a Tashin um, coffee table book of Marvel Silver Age history. Fun stuff there, with great artwork. Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, Incognito. Flex Metallo, this is a spinoff uh, that Grant Morrison, this character was created in, the, in Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol run, and then they spun him off with Frank Quietly into this little miniseries, Flex Metallo, that um, is equally thrilling and equally a histor historic account of comic book history. And then we have Gideon Falls, Volume 1, by Jeff Lemire and Andre Sorrentino. Fantastic modern horror comics um, that have two different characters from two different backgrounds and their stories intersecting in a way... Um, that is amazing. And I need to get volume two of that. These are actually upside down. I'm not really sure why. Let me just pull them over. Actually, I do know why. I was doing a video for cheap graphic novels where I was showing off these books and I threw them back up there and did that for them. Well, here's an opportunity to show them off. This is Crazy and Ignats. These are the George Harriman Library from Fantagraphics Books. Crazy, and Ig Crazy Cat was a comic strip of the Golden Age that was revolutionary for newspaper strips. And these are the first three volumes. I think it's gonna be a 10 volume set. I don't know if I'll keep going with it. Uh, volume four did come out recently and uh, I haven't picked it up yet. They're amazing, card they're, they're, they're amazing and I love them. And these books are beautiful. It's just 10 volumes and shelf space and all that, you know. You know how it goes. This is a treasury edition of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It has early Walt Simonson artwork and he's doing a Film adaptation of Steven Spielberg. Big guy, big guy in the Rusty the Boy Robot. This is a gift from my brother, the aforementioned Real American Brian, um, for me to enjoy with my son. I actually have the oversized hardcover now of that. You'll see in a later video. This is Al Columbia. He's a really haunting cartoonist, both in his real life and in the work that he does. But that's him doing like fake movie posters. Assassin Child from Tetsunori. Taiwa, Taiwaraya, um, just amazing single issue of him doing uh, crazy detailed artwork. JLA, this is actually my son's book. Destroy by Scott McCloud. This is Scott McCloud's commentary on a fight comic. So you can see it's massive in size. It's a single issue. And this is just these two superheroes fighting in a way that destroys New York City. Amazing comic book and really truly deserves that large size. Ken and Abel, Shaky Kane is one of my favorite cartoons going today. He has like a punk rock aesthetic to Jack Kirby. And then Crent Abel, this is them doing a um, anthology of work together. And this is Crent Abel by himself, his book of mischief. So we have Unsmooth, volumes one and two by E.S. Glenn. Um, number two, or issues one and two, I'm sorry. Number two would finish in my top 10 of 2021 um, in that video that I did. And then Shaky Kane, the aforementioned. You can see all the Kirby aesthetic on the cover. This is the Good News Bible. This includes all the strips that Shaky Kane did for Deadline Magazine. And it's collected in this thick trade paperback. Fantastic Four Antithesis. This is the Neil Adams Mark Wade um, four issue run in a Treasury edition. I do have a video on this. Um, and it's. Now it's very sad that this was uh, Neil Adams' last work, but it's a fantastic story. So he went out in a big way on top. This is the Spider-Man Tashin book. You can see how huge it is. 
Um, this collects the first 20 issues of Spider-Man. I love these Tashin books. Um, I do need to do a video on these because I love the way they reproduce the old comics. This is Fantastic Four Grand Design by Tom Scioli. Tom Scioli is amazing. I love him. And this is his take on Grand Design project. And then Ed Piscor, the godfather of the Grand Design. This is Hip Hop Family Tree. This takes place before any of the Grand Design, but it kind of acts now in retrospect as like a hip hop Grand Design. Kind of like his, uh, he's kind of taking the same idea of Grand Design and putting it onto the history of hip hop. Watching the Watchmen. This is a coffee table book by Chip Kidd and um, Mike Essel with Dave Gibbons. It just tells like a lot of behind the scenes of Watchmen, which is my all-time favorite comic book. Deconstructing Incal. So the Incal has a lot of high concepts and crazy ideas. So this kind of helps make sense of it, if you will. Space Hawk. I mentioned Basil Wolverton is one of my favorite cartoonists ever. This is him all of his science fiction tales of the character Space Hawk in this giant oversized uh, paperback. Darwin Cook, his um, take on the Parker character, on um, Richard Stark's Parker character. Those are the two Martini editions. Um, Darwin Cook's an amazing, amazing cartoonist and left us way too soon. Um, I think what he could have provided to the crime genre would be in a way that we... We hold like Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips up as like the guys that are really taking crime comic comics to another level today. Um, I put Darwin Cook's work in these Parker comics up there with them. And the last two, we have Love and Rockets, the covers. It's just a book that collects all the covers of the first 50 issues of Love and Rockets. And then Breakdowns. This is uh, Art Spiegelman's book. Art Spiegelman that did Mouse. Does a lot of his cartooning and stuff that he did for that hardcover. Okay, so this has been a long video and that was only two shelves. Um, but I want to do it this way. Like I said, shout out to For the Love of Comics. He was the inspiration behind me doing it this way. Um, I just love that he did it and he spent time on each book and whatnot and really showed him off. Please let me know in the comments if you want me to show off any of these books in a greater detail um, or if you have any thoughts on my library or books that you think I should pick up based on books that you saw here any of that jazz. Let's talk comics in the comments. Give the video a thumbs up and uh, subscribe and share it with all your friends. Thanks.